So my dad was very absent in, in, my, in my growing up, uh, as well as when he came back, you know, he had his own demons to deal with and he was dealing with alcohol. And uh, so he, on weekends where he should be at home, he was with his friends and he was drinking with his friends and stuff like that, you know. Um, and then of course that would roll into abuse in the home uh, with my mom. And so that was the sort of, thing. I'm trying to just paint the picture for you, you know, not to speak anything, anything bad about them because I love my parents too, but you know, um, and I understand where they came from in, back in those days. But I'm just trying to paint the picture for you that my home life was a stable home life. My home life was a very difficult home life. And that's eventually filtered into my schooling career. And I started doing terrible at school. I was unfocused. I was undisciplined. Um, I was rebellious in a way. Um, you know, I, I, there was a lot of, re because of, of that lack of leadership and a lack of, of mentorship that I had, in my home and affected me in school. And I ended up failing. I failed twice in school. I failed um, standard two and I failed standard six. So those were two years in my life where I failed and I had to repeat it in school. But nevertheless, when it came to about standard seven, standard eight, I knew, man, there's something that needed to change in my life. I needed, I needed something to change in my life. And uh, it just so happened, Mervyn Clark was going around Newlands and he was preaching and going to all different homes and having cell meetings. And they came and they had a cell meeting next door to my home and I went and I attended it. They asked me to attend it and I attended it. And I think it was in standard eight. Standard eight, I gave my heart to the Lord and my life changed from there. I got very committed in church, um, very committed. Every service I could find myself in, I was going to. And what began to happen is I began to get the mentorship that I was missing at home. I began to get it in the church. And I saw my pastor as a father figure in a way, listened to everything that he said, went with notes, took notes at every service, you know, uh, got into uh, 
whatever we could get into, we got into the psalmist ministry and to the, into the deaconship at that time. But that was my life for many, many years, now coming from school, going out of school into college. And that actually helped me a lot. Mm. Helped me, settled me. It got me to a point where I started focusing my life. I started mm. getting disciplined in my life. I started paying attention to the things that really mattered in my life. Mm. And that's where the gradual change began to happen. Gradual change in my life started to take place. You know, I'm going to say to you that a lot of people want to just see instant success. Instant success, it doesn't work that way. You know, I've been, I've been in business many, many years, and I can tell you something, is that my life was stages. It was a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time, I saw change happen in my life. I saw gradual change in, in where I was going. That, that in the latter years, when, when I weren't, when I was still failing, I felt like a failure. I mean, it affected me. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be in class. I was stuck in school. I didn't, want, I didn't want to talk in class. I didn't want to be part of anything in class because I felt like a failure. And once that change happened in my life and I started going to church and I started getting focused, for, for once in my life, I started actually winning. I started winning. I started seeing my results in school change. And after school, eventually, I, I put myself through varsity. Uh, my, my dad and him didn't have any money to send me through to varsity. I worked part-time and I put myself through varsity. And eventually I got my diploma and eventually I applied for a job that I was thought to go work in a bank, but I ended up in the insurance industry. So, you know, just to, to speak about this again, you know, is that it was gradual change that happened, not instantaneous change. Many times we want to see things just like that, you know, when I put popcorn in a microwave and we just want it to pop, 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 and it must just happen in life. And in business, it doesn't work that way. It's a process. It takes time. You have to give yourself time in business and you have to give yourself time in order to start seeing change and success happen in your life. And that's what happened, you know. And today, I, I mean, from a boy that was suicidal, a boy that came from a broken home. I mean, I forgot to tell you, my mom as well was uh, boarded from work in those earlier years because she was dealing with uh, mental issues. She had a nervous breakdown because of a robbery that happened at work. So they eventually she had a nervous breakdown. So I, I basically didn't have a good, good foundation to start with. But, you know, I want to say something is that, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter that, that that's in itself happened to me because that actually helped me move forward in my life. I mean, you know, today that has actually helped me become a better father. You know, my friends see it that, I actually overcompensate a lot because I want to make sure that where I had the voice that I felt when I was younger, I want to make sure that I cover them now. Yeah. I want to make sure that I'm there for them. I want to make sure that I'm involved in their school. I want to make sure that, that you know, I, I tell them that I love them, that I hug them and kiss them, you know. I want to be there for them where I didn't have that in my earlier years. So it's amazing how God works, you know, all things for the good, you know. So it's never a point to look at and say, okay, so that's why I'm going to be a failure. It's because of what I went through in my earlier years. No, it's not an excuse. You know, you can use that either as an anchor to keep you where you are, or you can use that as a, as a, as a brick or as something to move you forward, as a stepping stone to move you forward in life. And that's what I chose. I used this negative experience growing up, and I used this as a stepping stone to move forward. So this, so this was the young boy that I was, you know, failing right through school until, until I got saved, until I started going to church. And today, you know, I'm proud to say it, you know, that we built our own companies today. You know, everything we work for, we work for by the grace of God and we work for by ourselves. You know, we start with little, you know, and we apply the seed of planting the seed in the ground, of watering the seed, of cultivating the seed, of looking after the seed and protecting it and eventually growing that seed into a tree that will provide more fruit, taking some of the fruit, taking the balance of the fruit and investing it back in the ground. And that's what we did. And I'm proud to say today, you know, we built three multi-million rand companies. Our first company that we started was uh, Kingdom Life Financiers. That was the insurance side of our business and the investment side of our business. 
while was the investment, but it's the short term and the long term side of our business. That's our longest business uh, that we're running currently at the moment. And that's been doing very well. You know, we've turned it into a multi uh business that has looked after us. Yeah. And then we started a couple of years ago, said to Buddle that we need to get into property. If you follow me on Facebook and on my social platforms, you'll see that we all about property today. A lot of it has got to do with property investment. And later on in this in the seminar, I'm going to talk about it. And um, uh, so we started Kingdom Life Real Estate, and I actually pushed Verdell into it. I saw the talent and I saw the skills. And you know, I always say that she's she saved my testimony from April. Is it okay? Okay, I'll do that. I'll say that. Yeah. So anyway, she got into that, and under you know, in the first year, I think we did about what we did about over. Yeah, we okay. I'll leave it to her. She'll talk more about that part of the business. And then, of course, my baby, which is TMP Capital Investments. This is my recent venture we've started in the last, and this is a venture, I just want to say this, uh, everyone, is that this venture I started in COVID times. I didn't start it when everything was going wonderful and the economy was going great and everybody was talking about South Africa, that South Africa's economy is doing phenomenal uh, and this is the country to invest in. I did it in a time where I had a month off to sit at home and to, to reflect and to, and, to, and to strategize and to look at our business and to look at our companies and decide what we want to do going forward. And it's amazing, in COVID times, we started this business. I started this business called TMP Capital Investments. For three years, I piloted it. And I was doing it with my immediate family where I, they would invest with me and I would give them a certain amount of interest and I would eventually go and buy some property. I would develop it, I would turn it into multifamily units. And then I would lease it out um, and I would get the rental income and that's how I would pay the interest back to, to uh, my family. And of course, when they wanted their lump sums, I would pay it out to them as well. And in COVID times, I came across a guy named Grant Cardone and he's worth about over, his property portfolio is worth about easy over two point something billion dollars oh, yeah. today. Over two point something billion dollars. And I, and I listened to this guy before, but I listened to him on the sales side. And this time I had an opportunity to follow him on the property side. And I realized something, hey, but this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this with my family. I'm doing this with my mother and my mother-in-law. And I'm doing it with people that are close to me. And, and I realized that there's a business opportunity to take this to the market. So in COVID times, we started this business. And that business, in the last eight months, that business has done over 6.6 .6 million rand. We did 6.6 .6 million rand in the last eight months. In the last two years, we built a pro property portfolio. I think that in, no, in the last year, we bought, built a property portfolio worth about 16 million rand, sitting with a total portfolio of over 20 million country at the moment. And this is how this business actually took off. You know, uh, so we've seen, we've seen that in our business, we've seen our God has been faithful. We've seen how that when we've applied ourselves and applied principles, you know, that we saw that, you know, that even in the most difficult of times, we've seen that we can be successful in it. And hopefully tonight, and this is my this is my hope tonight, is that hopefully I can share it with you. Hopefully I can try and inspire you today. I can try and motivate you. I can try and encourage you, and I can also try and teach you, you know, to venture out there and to try and be the best version that you can be. And, uh, and that's why I share that scripture with you, you know, is that, that the Lord wants us to be the head and not the tail. He wants you to be above. You have to see yourself and you have to think of yourself that the Lord wants me to be above things. He wants you to be above debt. He doesn't want you to be under debt. He wants you to be above poverty. He doesn't want you to be beneath it. He doesn't want to see you in poverty. He wants to see you successful and not as a failure. You know, and that's an important, important scripture to me. So we're going to talk about money tonight. You know, I love, my <laughs> wife knows if there's anything I love talking about, Pastor, I love talking about money. I love talking about success. And I want you to say with me, say money. I want you to get comfortable. Please say money with me. I want you. I don't think they can hear you. You won't hear them. Is it? They say. Okay, great. So hopefully I can see your mouth move 
I hope I can hear you saying money. money. Say money. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about some money tips. There we go. Thank you, Sean Vero. Right? Yeah. I saw that. Great stuff. Wonderful. So we're going to talk about money tonight. So we're going to talk about business because the life, the lifeblood of business is money, is profit. If you're not making a profit, if you're not getting money and you're not earning money, your business will soon die a natural death and you'll soon have no business. It'll fail. And I'm going to show you as we go in, I'm going to show you some scriptures to back it as well and to speak about why you should be thinking about trying to get more money in your life. You know, I was, I met a good opportunity before um, last week, I think it was Pastor Renault, where we met each other in the gym and he was looking for his wife, quite frantically trying to find his wife. I don't know where his wife had disappeared to. <laughs> Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. He went to the gym and it was a good opportunity. I was having a breakfast meeting with my business partner and we had a good opportunity. And money is a necessary commodity in life. Yeah. I, I can't say this, you know, I can't say it anymore and express it anymore. It is so important. You know, if you have to look at just COVID times now, how many churches have closed their doors and had to put their buildings for sale because not of a lack of prayers and not because of a lack of fasting and not because of a lack of church attendance, but because of a lack of money, because of a lack of money. Money is so important. You know, it's so important, not only to you as an individual, but it's also important to the church. It's also important to society. It's also important to your family and to, to the communities that we live in. You know, I try my best you know, to try and get involved in our communities and to sponsor them. How do I sponsor them? I don't sponsor them with just kisses and I clap my hand and it. No, I sponsor them with money. I don't just sponsor them with my voice and say, I'm behind you. I'm supporting you. I sponsor them with money. If I didn't have, or I weren't blessed with a surplus of money in my life, I wouldn't be able to do that and be able to be a blessing to others. And that's the importance that you need to understand is that money is important. Money is important to your family, and it's, and it's, and it's according to your faith. Be it according to, to how far you see yourself. If you want to be a billionaire, wonderful. If you want to be just a millionaire, great. If you just want to make sure that you've got a fantastic salary and you're looking after your family and you're driving a nice car and your family has a nice car and you can tie it and you can sow into some, some, some different opportunities or give to some charities just a little, Wonderful, but don't tell me that you don't need money. Don't tell me that you don't need it in your family. I'll tell you something, your family life will be better if you have a little bit more money. I'll guarantee you that. So we're going to talk about some money tips, some money principles. You know, I've, I've got a lot of information I can share with you, but I'm going to stick to time uh, because we've got to bring Vidal on and Vidal's going to share some stuff from her side. So I'm going to try try and just keep it as a little bit short and we're going to talk about some stuff and and we're going to try and, and navigate through this and just try and find out how can I improve my life and how can I get into business and how can how can I start living on top? Yeah. How can I start being on top and not beneath? How can I be the head and how can I not be the tail today? So one of the first principles that I love talking about is that you need to understand that in business and in life, you need to fail and learn. You need to get comfortable with that. You need to get comfortable with failing and learning. Failure is a part of your journey. You know, I always say this here, that the brick, that the, that the road is paved with the bricks of failure. Failure is part of your journey. Don't see it as a negative thing. A lot of us see failure as a negative thing. And you know what's the next thing we start doing? We phone Pastor Randolph and we start saying, I don't think this is for me. I don't think the Lord wants me to be in this anymore. I think the Lord is trying to tell me that I shouldn't do this anymore and this is not for me. No, you're giving up too easy, sir. Failure is a part of your journey. I always say this, and, and this is something I share with my staff, is that there's a difference between accepting failure and failing. There's a difference between the two. Failing is a part of your journey. Accepting it and accepting that failure is a part of your life and that failure is you is very different. I had to choose in my younger days that failure is not me. 
It was a circumstance. Yeah. It, was a, it was a time in my life, an event in my life that I was going through. And I felt that I was failing. But look at me today. I am a, a result to show you that failure is not you today. Yeah. You might have failed once, you might have failed twice, you might have failed three times, but failure is not you. It's only events, it's a time in your life. And you can change that. You can change that. You need to understand that it's just part of your journey. I still fail. Ask me today, ask my wife. I mean, I fail many times, many times. I mean, even today, you know, even today, I can tell you about almost my journey that every day I face something different. And I fail sometimes. I still fail even up to today. And I can tell you something that the most successful people today, even Gronkadon, that's worth over $2 billion today, still fails today. Yeah. We all, we all, as long as you are still on this journey to success, and as long as you're still trying to go out and pursue your dreams, you will fail. But the important thing is that you need to learn is that you fail and you learn. Yeah. It's an opportunity to teach you something. It's an opportunity to teach you something. So some quick steps, I just want to tell you about it. When you fail, when you fail in life, when you're failing on your journey, the first thing you do is deal with your mind. Deal with your mind and understand that failure is not you. Understand that it's just part of your journey. Yeah. That's all. Deal with your mind. I'll tell you why. Your mind dictates what your body does. You go and see a person that is suicidal, that is emotionally unstable, and tell me what is their actions. Tell me what do they do on a daily basis. I can tell you something, they're probably going and standing and admiring a lot of bridges. A lot of bridges. Wondering which one to jump for. You look at a person that is successful, that is finding success in his business, that is finding success in his life or in his marriage, and you look at his actions. And I'll guarantee you that his actions are positive because it starts in your mind. And that's why you need to deal with your mind first. The first thing is, when you start encountering failure in your journey, deal with your mind. Start working on your mind. Take time. The next step is take time out and focus. Focus yourself. Take time to yourself. It's many times that when I fail, you know, I don't want to be around people. The first thing I do is I pull myself away and I start thinking and I start giving myself to meditation, to prayer maybe even as well, and trying to understand what happened. Identify, the next one is identifying the shortfalls. Identifying why that happened. Start asking yourself questions like this. Why did I fail? And be real with yourself. That's not a time to lie to yourself. That's a time to be real yeah. with yourself and understand why did you fail. Be honest with yourself. The next thing that I want to share with you is the most important part of dealing with that. The next thing is that you have to respond immediately. Business people don't have the luxury and the time to delay stuff and procrastinate. You have to respond immediately to it. Respond immediately and kill your fear that you're feeling at that time. Because at the time, you're probably feeling fear. You're probably feeling doubt. You're probably feeling, I'm a failure. I don't know what to do, that sort of stuff. That's the time that you need to respond immediately and kill that fear with positive material. Positive material. Find positive material in a time that's not only going to encourage you, because it's not only about encouraging you, but also will teach you, will help you and give you, teach you how to react the next time you're facing that. To teach you how to come on top or be on top of the situation the next time it faces you. That's what you need to do. And that's the most important step now. Yeah. Remember we spoke about uh, uh, being an observer and being a doer in Deuteronomy. We're talking about the doing part now, not the observing part. Respond immediately. It's the time to, for you to respond, not the time for you to sit back and just ponder. You need to ponder, meditate, find out, be real with yourself and understand where your shortfalls are, where your shortcomings are, why you failed, and immediately respond to the fear that you're feeling 
and start doing something. Find material that's going to encourage you. Find material that's going to teach you. Find, go on to Google, go on to WhatsApp, go speak to your pastor, go pull out some of his sermons, but things that are relevant to what you are feeling at that point in time and deal with it. Next thing, what we need to do, we need to understand some money tips we're talking about. Number two, money loves challenges. I, I specifically drop them below each other. Money loves challenges. If you're going to get into business today and you want to achieve some level of success in your life, I'm telling you this, you're going to have challenges. And the higher you go, the bigger the challenges you're going to face. Yeah. The bigger the challenges you're going to face. Every day, I deal with challenges. Every day. Every day, Varel deals with challenges. You have to learn that it's going to be part of your life. Let's just quick quick scripture. I just want to share something with you. Joshua 1 verse 7. I'm sure you'll know all this. You'll know the scripture. You'll know it. Where the Bible says that he spoke to Joshua and he said, Joshua, I want you to be strong and very courageous. He says, be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses. All right. Do not turn from it, neither to the left or to the right, that you may be what? That you may be successful wherever you go and in whatever you do. Now think about this. This is, this is Joshua who is taking over Moses' job. I mean, I, I would have been a bit I would have been like, hey, Lord, I'm not going to take Moses' job. I mean, this journey we were supposed to go on, these stubborn people, Israelites here, took us over 40 years because they were so stubborn. How am I going to lead these people? You open up the, you open up the earth and swallowed some of them because they were so stubborn. You've got serpents to bite them. No, I can't lead these people. Plus, you want me to take them to a land that's full of giants. But the Lord says to Joshua, be what? Be strong and be very courageous. Because why? Because he knew that Joshua, you're going to face challenges. There's going to be challenges along this journey that you're going to face. Challenges is good for business. Now, you'll see that I'll always try and bring the, the, net, the spiritual part and I'll try and naturalize this here as we go. Challenges is good for business. It's good for business. It'll help you to see your shortfalls. It'll also help you to see as a leader where you're falling short. And as in your company, where are you falling short? Challenges is there to highlight some stuff, like some stuff that you need to understand. I need to change now. I need to change some processes, or I need to change some procedures, or I need to change some individuals. I need to fire some, and I need to employ some new individuals for that position. Challenge will teach you more about yourself than anything else in life will teach you. A company, a good company, is built on great leadership and good policies and procedures. And challenges will help you develop this. I heard Raylene last week speaking about a business plan, fantastic, wonderful and stuff. I'll tell you something, is that you'll be able to start your business and you'll try your best and put all these policies and all these procedures in place. But I will guarantee you something, that as you go in, you'll find out that every day you're going to have to tweak it. It's going to change. It doesn't stay the same. You'll find out that you might have put a process in place and you'll find out that a challenge happens in that situation. And it, it'll, it'll highlight that that process or that policy or that procedure is not good enough. And it means that you need to start changing it. That's the dynamic of it, the business side of it, is where... When you're dealing with challenges, it'll teach you. It'll tell you, okay, this is not working now. We need to do something else. We need to change this up. We need to just do something different. We need to maybe maybe put a new process in place. Maybe we need to get a manager that will look that will start overseeing this here. So we need to make sure, like it's with us in my business. Um, you know, we, we brought a new company on, and the company that we brought on, we found out. You know, that all we can do is underwriting on the phone and we can just do the, the policy, the contract for a client just like that. Within five minutes, everything gets done on the phone. And immediately, because of my experience and because I knew the challenges that I faced before, 
I immediately dealt with it and I said, no, 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 we need to make sure that this goes through my manager first. It needs to be validated. We need to validate the client. We need to see that the client's affordability is there. We need to see bank statements. We need to see speaker documents need to come in in order for us then to approve it and then go to the process of going onto the phone, doing underwriting and getting the case accepted. And, and that's what Challenges does. Challenges teaches you and develops you and prepares you for, for situations that are lying ahead, that you can be more smart and you can deal with them in a slightly different way. So be mindful about that. So let's talk about that. What should you never do when you're dealing with challenges? When you're dealing with challenges in your business, you're dealing with challenges in your life, make sure that you never make an irrational, emotional, permanent decision for a temporary situation. Don't become irrational. Don't become emotional. You know, that's the first thing. I, I, I mean, over the years, I'm still growing in this process. And I still have my moments where I can almost, I can almost burst and my staff will, will hear my voice go up a little bit and stuff like that. I mean, I'm still, I'm still growing, right? <laughs> I'm still growing. I'm still growing, yeah. But never make an irrational, emotional, permanent decision for something that might only be temporary. You know, and that's one of the most important things you need to do when you're faced with challenges, because I guarantee you something, when you start going through challenges, this is what's going to happen. You're going to feel this way. The second thing is turn your attention to the solution and not the problem. As a business person, you need to understand if you're going to go into business, you know, you need to understand that you're going to have to become a solution problem solving person. You're going to have to solve problems every single day because every day you're going to be faced with different things and you're going to be faced with different problems and you can't just focus on the problem. You can't just take your attention and just give your attention to the problem. You have to start dealing with the solution to that. Remember what I said previously in the first um, principle is that you need to respond. How quick you respond to a problem is very important in business. It's very important. It means it's, 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 it actually it looks at what could happen going forward in your business. You take too long to respond to something, it could affect your money down the line. Yeah. It could affect your profit margin down the line because you were too slow to make a decision. You were too unfocused and too irrational and too emotional not to focus yourself and deal with the problem, to deal with the solution. Focus your attention on the solution. Calm your emotions and act on the problem. Be responsive. Be responsive as, as soon as it happens, as, as soon as you must deal with it. Don't delay and don't procrastinate. As a leader and as a businessman, I can tell you that it's, it's too, I mean, we had a situation in our country where a lot of people thought that our president, when, when we had this looting in our country, that it just took far long, far too long. To react. And honestly, as me as, and I'm not talking about leadership now, I'm not talking about him, but if I had to look at it and speak from a leadership point of view, I also felt that way. I also felt that it was just taking far too long to respond to the situation. And if we have to look at the damage today, the damage is worth over two, over two billion rand worth of damages. Now the question is, is that the question is, could we have as a country responded quicker? And could we have limited the damage? Could we have limited maybe to a billion rand instead of over two billion rand? And this is what I'm talking about when I say to you as a leader that, and as a businessman is that you need to be responsive. You need to respond immediately, immediately. With a calm mind, with a rational mind, focusing on the solution and not the problem. Are we still there? Great stuff. Can you just give me a wave? All right, great stuff. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we're going to deal with the third, third part of it. Third money tip that we need to understand. You need to acquire in business, you need to acquire knowledge and learn the game. Now, this is an important part that I'm talking about. I want to say to you that, that in, in business, a lot of people see business as a game. A lot of people see business as a game. I don't know if you ever played Monopoly. Have you ever played Monopoly? I'm sure, I'm sure with your kids, you know, you, 
you spin the dice and you move. And as you move in, you earn money. And as you earn money, you start buying pieces of land. The first start is with a piece of land. And then from the piece of land, it then goes to one greenhouse, then it goes to two greenhouses, then three. And then after that, you can buy the hotel. Now, I was not the very smartest person when we played Monopoly because I didn't understand it. So I used to play with, with my brother and I used to play with my friends that knew the game, that understood how the game works. So I would go and I would try and accumulate as much cash as possible. I mean, I would have these thick wax of cash. But my, my friends and my brother would go and they would buy land. They would take the cash and they would buy land and they would buy houses and eventually it turned into a hotel. And soon I found myself falling onto those pieces of land, those properties. And as, we, as I fell into those properties, I ended up having to pay though my brother and I had to pay my, my uh, I'm so sorry about this. We had, we had load sharing at our place. We had load sharing at our place and we had to move to our office. So our office line is just ringing at the moment. I don't know if we can just take it off the hook. Thank you. And I found myself that, I found myself that I was paying out more cash and they would eventually take all the cash that I accumulated they would take it and I would eventually lose the game. So you need to understand something that in the world system and in business, a lot of it is a game. A lot of it is something that you need to learn how to play. You need to learn how it works. So some of the things I spoke about in, in business is that you need to understand is that the bank, the bank is an important part to your business. The bank is a very, very important part to my business. In fact, I don't do anything I don't do anything in my financial part of my business without my bank. When I want to buy a property, I buy it. I don't use my own cash. I learn something. I don't use my own cash. I go to the bank. I do a bond application with them, and I get them to loan me the money to buy the property. And what I do is I take a little bit of my own cash. I invest it into the properties, turn them into these beautiful multifamily properties, and then I get rental income, and I start earning income as people stay on my land. So I've learned an aspect of, of business and your business might be slightly different, but you need to learn the game in your business. And one of the most important people in your business should be your bank. One of them should be your bank. Build relationships with your bank. Build relationships with your suppliers and any intric intricate person that is involved in your business. Start building relationships. I do it as much as I can. I build relationships with people, people that, that are holding my money, the people that I'm dealing with in business. I try and build relationships with them as much as possible. I want to say to you, be loyal to those people. Be loyal to them. I, I think if I have to go back and think about it, I had an EPSA account when I was 16 years old. I think my mom and dad helped me open it. But when I came of age, I opened my own account at Standard Bank and I've never changed my bank. I've never changed my bank after that. I've built relationships with my bank. Why? Because my bank sees everything, every transaction that goes in and out of my accounts. They see every bond that I hold, every bond I do only with Standard Bank. I don't do it with any other bank. I used to do it with SA Home Loans. So what I would do is, I would do a bond application. Now, this is where I say to you, learn the game. I would do an application with Standard Bank and I'll do an application with a couple other banks. But in my mind and my heart, I know what I'm going to do. I know that when Standard Bank approves me, they're going to give me a rate. I know that when SA Home Loans approves me, they're going to give me a rate. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start playing the two of each other or the three or four of each other because I learned the game. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to Standard Bank. So I hope, I hope none of None of my other bankers are watching this or are not, are not on this because they'll be like, the next time we want to do an application, they're going to be like, sorry, I heard what you said on the seminar and we're not prepared to do the application. With you. <laughs> so learn game. You have to. You have to be smart and you have to build relationship with these people. They have to. They have to start wanting to want to deal with you. They must see that you're loyal to them. Loyal to me, loyalty to me is one of the most important things in business. I can tell you something. If there's one thing in business that you must learn with your suppliers and with your, your bankers or, or anybody that's part of your business, be loyal to one person as much as you can. In our construction side of the business, 
I only deal with one hardware store. I don't deal with two or three or four or five hardware stores. I only deal with one. And you know what he does? He rewards me and he takes me out to for, for prawns. And you know, we go have <laughs> these big dinners and he spoils me with prawns and, and crayfish and all that there as well. So he, he, he does his part as well because he's learned the game. He's learned how to play the game. He's learned that this is a guy that's giving me all his business. I need to look after him. And that's something that you need to do as well. You need to learn the game. Learn your industry. Learn how it works. Learn everything about your industry and then start working the system. Start working the system. Build loyalty with people and understand that the bank is, a, in, is one of the most important people in your business. One of the most important partners in your business. Use the bank to finance your deals and to build cash flow. I'm just going to drop this in. Use the bank to finance your deals. No matter what business you are in, start buying property. It doesn't matter what business you're in, whether you are in real estate, whether you are in the insurance industry, whether you're in textiles, whether you, you are in, um, what, in, in production, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe in plumbing, in electrical, it doesn't matter. Start building a property portfolio that can give you, that you can build equity on a daily basis and you can start earning cash flow from it. And that's all I do. I invest my money. I don't invest it in Bitcoin. I don't understand it, so I don't invest in it. I don't invest in Forex. I, I mean, these are just high risk. I, I did it before in my life. And I burnt my fingers. I've learned a lot of people that have did products and have burnt their fingers. I don't want to talk bad about those industries. I mean, but for me, property is, is the industry that I want to deal with. And that's where all my money goes into. I'm just about building, using the bank's money to, to get bonds, to, uh, to eventually take those properties, turn them into multifamily properties, start earning cash flow on a monthly basis. Cash is not king. Cash flow is king. If you... If you listen to what I said in Monopoly, I thought I had the whack of cash. I thought I was king. Eventually, all that cash went to who? It went to my brothers and it went to my friends that had all those properties that eventually I had to go and rent over there and pay out. Cash flow is king, not cash. I want to change your thinking a little bit. And I want you to understand that cash is not king. A lot of times we think that it is, but it's not. Cash flow is king. You want to generate you want to invest into assets that assets are going to pay you every single month. And that's how you're going to build your finances. That's how you're going to build stability in your finances as well. So learn the game. Go use Google and YouTube. I'll tell you something. Anything that I want, anything that I want to know, that I want to learn, I go into YouTube and I go into Google. Use it. Anything that you want to learn, it's available to you. And I don't just say it as, as a statistical thing. I really use it daily. I go onto YouTube, I, I write in some words, I look at videos and I love watching videos and I learn and I learn and I learn. Learn, you can learn so much about your industry if you just start going onto YouTube and start putting in some keys, writing some stuff in and, and, and watching some videos. You will learn things that you would never be able to learn in a, even in a varsity, I'll tell you something. There's so much that I've learned in my experience and I've learned through YouTube and through Google, I mean, that I never learned in DUT, <laughs> serious. So that's something I want to leave you with as well. Number four, pay attention to your money. This is a very important point I want you to hear. Pay attention to your money. Watch every debit, watch every credit that goes off your account I want you to document every movement, upward movement, downward movement. Understand when at the end of the month, did you make, is your, is your business growing or did you lose some profit this month? I want you to get so pedantic about your money. I want you to watch it every single day. There's not a day I don't go onto my phone and I don't go onto my app and go look at my account and go and see my money. Not a day that I, that I don't do that. Every single day, because I'm in, in, I'm, my business is where money comes in on a daily basis. I mean, I can be sitting today and I'll just hear, 
a beep go off in my account and money is deposited into my account. I pay attention to my money like you can't believe. Except, pay attention. Except when the wife swipes, then those you overlook. Okay. Look past those ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, she thinks I don't pay attention to that. But believe me, I even pay attention to all those swipes that are going off as well. She forgets that when I post the reno and post the reno, when I when she goes to the shop and she swipes and I get the SMS and I say, hey, babes, what did you buy from uh, Pick and Pay? Why so much? Why? What you into words for? You know, so I pay attention to every debit and every credit that goes off my account. I document everything. Document every income that comes in, every expense that goes off. I've got, I've got, I've got spreadsheets that 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 I look at. That if you had to look at it, you will actually you'll get confused because I document everything that is going on when it comes to my finances. When it comes to money, I pay so much attention to it. Why? Because whatever you pay attention to will come to you. Whatever you don't pay attention to in life will eventually, I mean, if, if you, I'm trying to just give this in the most practical way, is that if you don't pay attention to your health, for example, eventually what will you find happen to you? You'll yeah. find out that your, your health will start to deteriorate. You'll find that you stop putting on the weight. You'll find that you start now, you, you, your sugar starts dropping or your sugar will go high and high blood pressure. All these things, Arthur comes and visits you, arthritis, by the way. Will start Arthur and Martha will visit you and all that, all because you weren't paying attention to it. You weren't paying attention to your health. The same principle is with money, is that you need to pay attention to your money. You need to be very pedantic when it comes to your finances. Every day, go into your accounts and look at it. Even if you haven't seen an increase or in decrease, it, look at it. I mean, pull out, a, pull out the, the report for the last three months in your bank statement and just go through it. And just look, you'll be amazed to find some debits or some credits, credits that you never saw before, that you didn't see, that you will pick up at that point in time. Pay attention to it. Have a daily picture of where your money is going and invested. It's very important that you know where your money is going. Just like me, I, I take my money, I, I always, I say this here, and this is an important thing to me is, Keep your mind rich, but keep your account poor. <laughs> so she doesn't spend all the money. Yeah, so she doesn't. And, and I purposely do that. I make her think that we've got no money in our accounts. I just keep moving it. So she doesn't spend it too fast. Yeah. So make sure that you keep your mind rich, but keep your account poor. What do I mean? I take all my money. As I get money that comes through at the end of the month, I look at my finances. I pay what I need to pay. And any surplus money that I have, I move it into my properties. I move it into my access funds and I move it into my properties. That's what I do. I invest it into our properties. And, and I always do that because I want to create cash flow. It's all about cash flow for me. So it's important to understand where your money is going. Understand where your money is going. And if you're not making money in where your money is sitting, take your money out. You know, don't leave your money in investments that are make, not making money. I mean, I want to share this with you, and I hope there's not any financial advisors watching this. But for many years, I did investment policies and stuff, and I tried my best to make money for retirement annuities, doing retirement annuities and endowment plans. But I promise you, today I own not one retirement plan, no investment uh, uh, endowment plan. Actually, I don't even believe in it. I believe that the best place that you can put your money into is into your access bond and into your property. Rather go buy properties, rather turn them into multifamilies, rather get people to rent them, build up equity over the years, and rather get a cash flow that comes in on a monthly basis. Then take your money that I've looked at for the last 10, 15 years and see my clients only making 5%. And the companies are taking over 4, 5% fees on a yearly basis. I mean, how are you going to make money? So I'm saying to you, know where your money is going. Understand where your money is going. And if your money is not making money for you, pull it out. Pull it out. Be, start being more pedantic about where your money is and what you do with your money. I'm going to, I'm going to talk, I've got, just, I've got three more points, but I can see that I'm running behind in time. So I'm just going to talk about point five, and then I'm going to go to um, my last point being a results of the person. But I want to talk about point five is 
learn to invest. And when I say learn to invest, I mean learn to sow as well. I just want to share something with you. Is that the reason why I think I'm also so successful in business is because of the principles that I learned in the church. Uh, when I was in church, we were taught to be givers. We were taught, taught to release. Before you see any results, sow. Sow and it shall be given back to you. Press down, shaken together. Will men give into your bosoms? Will businesses give into your bosoms? Will clients give into your bosoms? And I've, and I've learned that. I've learned for many years to be a sower in the kingdom of God. And because of that, when it comes to business, I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem investing, releasing money out of my hands to try and get a result. I don't have a problem sowing in, 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 or investing into myself as a person or into my business. I don't have a problem investing into my properties. I don't have a, a problem investing into my marketing. I don't have a problem investing into my people to train my people and to make sure that they, they are adequate and they, they are the best salespeople out there, best administrators in the market. I don't have a problem investing in infrastructure. And this is all because of what I learned in the church. I learned to be a sower. I learned to give. And it's the same principle. Whether you look at it from an investment point of view, or whether you look at it from a sowing point of view, I understand the sowing part of it. But I, I, I tell you something, if you can learn that principle, then in business it's more or less the same. You learn to give. You learn to let money go first before with the hope that eventually it's going to materialize into something. And it's going to pay you back a profit. And it's going to give you more. It's going to give you a profit or two, more money you will receive. So I learned that principle in the church. And for me, I found out that learning to be a sower and learning to be a giver in the industry or learning to invest in this nutshell of being in the business world has been an easy place for me. And that's what I want to encourage you about is that the, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm successful is because I'm a giver. I don't have a problem with that. I've learned the principle. You know what? Let me sh share this here. You know, and if, and if, uh, if this is something I just want to share with you. I shared it with Pastor Randolph. I am a faithful tither. Myself and my wife are faithful tithers. Through COVID times, we never missed our tithe, not once. Not once did we, not, did we say we are not going to tithe because of COVID. And we could have used it as an excuse. I'm sure Pastor Randolph uh, can think about some, I don't want to say it, but um, some instances where he got an email or he got, got a call saying, I can't tie this month because of this and this reason. We've never, by the grace of God, we never missed our tithe, not once. Through COVID times, my wife, as soon as she, the income comes in from her, she pays a royalty and after royalty she ties and then we do what we need to do. We've never missed it. I don't have a problem with giving. I don't have a problem that when people come to me and they speak about charity events or they, in, I love the community where I come from, Newlands East, and many people that are from Newlands uh, that have had charity events that have approached me, we've sold into it. We've, I mean, Abantu, I can speak about, about three or four different charity events that we've given to. I've learned these principles in church. I've learned to be a giver. And because of that, in business, I apply the same principle, but in a natural way. I learn to let go of money into marketing, into my people, people development, into my infrastructure, into buying properties for my business, into, uh, um, into my investments. And from that, we wait for a return to come from that. So I want to leave you with that. Remember that part. And you can go to Luke, that's in Luke. Uh, the scripture for that is actually Luke 6 and verse 38, where it speaks about that. Given it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together. Will men give into your bosom? Will clients give into you? Will businesses give into you? Remember that, what I'm saying to you. Now, I'm going to leave the next point and I'm going to go to my last point. Um, in fact, let me, I'm not going to go to that point. Let me just end off here because I want to hand it over to Virgil. No, 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 it's fine. We, we, the time is, uh, yeah, it's 10 oh, plus 8. I want to say to you, I want to share this in my closing. If I might interject, please feel, free to, please feel free to cover that point. Um, I'm sure everyone wouldn't mind you 
continuing beyond the allocated time. So uh, don't be too time. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> as I am are finding this hugely beneficial. So please continue. Awesome, awesome. Okay, I want you to listen to the next two things. I want you to listen to this point and I want, to listen, I want you to listen to my closing. Is that the last point, be a result driven person. Money in, in business, money follows results. If you don't have results, ultimately your business is going to fail. Your business will die and it will fail without results. I want you to transition your mind in thinking that I need to be a result-driven person. Now, I want to share something with you. In fact, when I was preparing this here, I came across this here. And in Mark 11 and verse 12 to 21, the, the Bible says this, that Jesus was walking with his disciples on his way to Jerusalem. I want you to listen to this here. And on his way to Jerusalem, he saw, from afar, he saw a fig tree. He saw something that looked like a fig tree. It had the form of a fig tree. It had the leaves of a fig tree. It had the size of a fig tree. And it looked like it had figs on it. And the scripture says that Jesus went close to it because he was hungry. And he went to go and eat off the fig tree. And as he went and he put his hands into the leaves to try and pick off any figs, he found that the fig tree did not have any fruit. It didn't have any results. And the scripture says this, it made sure that it says this, that it was not the season for that fig tree to bear its fruit. But you know what happened? The scripture says that Jesus cursed the tree. He cursed the tree that the tree should die and it should wither away. And they proceeded and they continued through to Jerusalem. They did what they needed to do and for the sake of time, on their way back, the Bible says that, that the disciples saw that tree and that tree started to die and started to wither. Now, I want to share something with you. Jesus was, as a leader, was a result-driven leader. This is one example of it. I always ask the question, okay, all right, I understand below it speaks about that it was speaking about faith. He spoke about faith. Okay, so why didn't Jesus say to the fig tree, how many times he turned water into wine? He raised people from the dead. Why didn't he speak to the fig tree and say that you shall bear fruit? Why, didn't, why did he curse it? Because he knew that at the same time, he knew it wants a season for figs. But I think what we can get from this is that Jesus is a result-driven leader. He's a result-driven leader. It is not good enough for you to have the form of a business. It is not good enough for you to look like a business, to talk like a business. To, it's not good enough it's for you to smell like a business. You need to have fruit in your business. Yeah. You need to have results. Results is the most important thing that you need to have in your business. And you need to understand that in order for me to have results, failure, I cannot accept failure. Failure is not part of my thinking. From today, I want you to take failure out of your mind. In order for you to be a result-driven person, you need to remove failure from your mind and from your business. Failure must not be part of your vocab. You need to understand that making excuses will only be a crutch in your business. You need to take that crutch and you need to throw them away. Get rid of those excuses. Why? Because they will handicap you. A crutch will handicap you. It will not only handicap you, it will disable you in business. Get rid of all your excuses. Why? Because they will always be there if you keep them. If you allow them to be there, they'll always be there. I mean, have you spoken to people that every single time they've got an excuse? For whatever, wherever they failed or whatever, something never happened, there's always an excuse for it. Winners don't talk like that. Entrepreneurs don't talk like that. I'll tell you something. You sit with an entrepreneur and you'll find out that excuses are never part of his vocab. And you need to understand that, that you need to remove that. Thing. Become more flexible and creative. 
Become more flexible and creative and start working. Do whatever it needs to take to get the job done. No matter if you have to spend your time till 12 o'clock at night. If you have to work till 12 o'clock at night, you get up 4 o'clock in the morning, put in the time and do whatever it takes to get the job done. Because at the end of the day, results is what matters. When you start running a business, you understand that I've got people to pay. I don't have the luxury for excuses because I've got my staff to pay at the end of the month. If I don't get results and I don't get income coming in, I can't pay my staff. I can't pay my life bill. I can't pay my insurance. So I can't pay my bonds. So I can't pay uh, uh, my, my suppliers that supply me with, with our printing facilities and stuff like that. I can't pay them. And as an entrepreneur, you understand that there's no room for excuses because we don't have the luxury to go to those people and say, I can't pay you because I didn't get the results. You need to start putting in the work and doing whatever it takes to get the job done. Get flexible, get creative. Don't do the same thing. If, you, if you're doing something and you're not getting the results and you're failing, it's time to change it up and get flexible and get creative in your workplace and in your job and in your business. Why? Because someone said this, is that it's a form of insanity to do the same thing over and over and expect a different results. You can't expect a different results if you're doing the same thing. You're failing at something and you're not getting the results and you're not making that money and you're not getting that profit, then it's time to start changing things up in your business. And this is my conclusion. Don't ever think that we live in a poor country. Don't ever believe that. Don't ever let someone or what you see around you make you feel that we live in a poor country. We don't live in a poor country. We live in a very rich country. In the year 2020, our GDP, our gross domestic product was over 302 billion US dollars. In the year 2020, in a time of COVID, our GDP was worth over two point, sorry, $302 billion. I looked at the exchange rate today and it's about 15 point something. That works out to over 4,600 billion rand. There's only a population of 57 million people living in our country. If you had to take 4,600 billion rand and divide it by 57 million people living in our country, we would all be worth millionaires today. We will all be worth over 80 million rand today. Every single one of us will become instant millionaires. That's how rich our country is. Don't ever let the circumstances and let you see around you think that we live in a poor country where I can't make, I can't make it yet. I can't, I can't be successful. I can't start a business that could make money. There is too much money in our country to make, be made. In fact, I thought about Sydney, Australia, just for the sake of Mr. The, the last speaker that spoke, and they did about 1.6 trillion US dollars. Their population is actually only about 27 million or something. Far more wealthier and far more wealth to go around to every single one. And that's in Australia. Don't ever think we live in a poor country. Our GDP is speaking about money that has been circulated in the year 2020 over $302 billion was circulated and been changing hands between individuals, between companies, between product suppliers and providers that were all changing hands, businesses that were changing hands to the value of over $302 billion. Amazing. Don't ever think that we live in a poor country. There is too much wealth out there. There's too much money for you to make out there. And if you want to start your business and you want to go out there and you want to start, uh, start creating wealth for yourself, to whatever level you want to do it at, you can't do it in South Africa. You can't do it because there's too much wealth in our country. And that's what I want to leave with you today. I want you to go out there and I want you to venture out into the marketplace. I want you to change your mind 
from being just an employee. Start thinking like an entrepreneur. Start thinking like an entrepreneur. And that's what our society needs and that's what our communities need. We need people to start creating jobs. People that, that go through our school systems and our schools need to start teaching this here. That you don't need to be an employee. It's by choice. You can be it by choice. And I understand that, you know, we need to have our public servants and understand that we need to have our doctors and stuff. And that will be an employee sort of position and stuff like that. But I'm saying for you, it's a choice to decide if you want to be an entrepreneur. And I tell you something that today there's an op opportunity for you to be an entrepreneur today. Start. And I hope this uh, these points I gave you led you down that road that you can start seeing yourself as an entrepreneur and start thinking like an entrepreneur. And you can take someone that failed twice in school, that came from one of an unstable background and turned it around and made himself successful through the grace of God. And from that, I want to hand it over and say thank you so much to Pastor Bonner, uh, to Pastor Randolph and Pastor Renee, and I'm going to hand it over to my beautiful wife, which will continue. <laughs> Thank you. All the stress is now being released. And on to me. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Pastor Randall, Pastor Renee Barnwell, and, and the leadership of Gate Ministries. Hi, Facebook family. I really want to just thank you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'm a bit nervous, so please forgive me. I'm not as eloquent as Mr. Peterson, who can just rap for an hour and a half and have success tips and points and stuff. But I think at the most I can do is just be as real as possible. Yeah. And um, my task tonight is just to share, you know, we didn't start off like this. So we weren't business owners from, you know, when we began. This is a journey spanning 15 years. We are married 15 years um, together for 23 that, years. Is that how long it is? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know, I just really wanted to share on what I do and the two important principles that the Lord taught me during my years of mentorship in our previous church and just basically what I do practically to balance business, family and marriage. So, you know, like I said to you, we never fell into this life. We were not business people when we were married. I was working for a firm of attorneys and he was in... Um, he was in for Momentum at the time. Yeah. He was working for Momentum and as a financial advisor. And, you know, it was then that I started learning how to be married, number one. And, you know, there were no kids at the time, so it was a bit easier to manage because it was just his work, my work, and come home in the evening and catch up and all that kind of thing. Um, but balancing these three pillars now, I understand that there's a grace for it. Mm -hmm. Nothing else but a grace to manage these three things. Yeah. Because let me tell you, it's not easy. It's Absolutely. in no way is this easy. Um, and I said to you, you know, it's a flow that we've learned and I've been taught by the Holy Spirit and submitted myself to mentorship. And this is one of the things I learned is that I can't do this by myself. I have to submit myself under mentorship. I looked at people that inspired me and try and saw, you know, what was it that made them so successful? So the story started 15 years ago. And like I said to you guys, when we got married, I was working at the time Alvin was... Um, working as a financial advisor and basically you know what i decided i'm tired of work i don't want to do this anymore it was frustrating me so i resigned from my job and i tried to stay home for three months and it was a total total disaster because i realized that being at home for three months was just not my thing i felt like my brain was dying honestly it just wasn't for me i felt like i had more inside of me that i needed to do and to you know to people of myself and being at home just wasn't it so i forced and I went to work with him yes. and I went to do his administration and to irritate him at work. And right. let me tell you, that's where the fight started. Yes. That was where the, <laughs> what is it, metal on metal when your brakes go away. Yes. <laughs> that was when all of that started. And it really was that it was just difficult to find a balance between you know, being married, number one, being a new, newlywed couple, living at home together, going to work and being there together and just seeing each other all the time. Mm -hmm. I think for me, that was the difficult part. Um, we were all day, every day in each other's faces. And that really, really was something that we didn't, it wasn't working for us. So the very first lesson I learned, if I can quickly go through this, was that structure protects relationships. 
But when I say that, I mean that I had to learn and be open to the fact and learn new methods of coping with working with this person, being married, being at home, seeing it all the time, you know, things like that. I had to come up with ways to protect our relationship because it wasn't easy to be in your face all the time, even though people think it is, you know, it's actually not, you know, I had to learn to, when we were working together, we'd have an argument about work. Mm. And then I had to learn not to bring that work argument home. Mm. And then I had to learn not to take, if I was mad with him, he didn't help do the washing or whatever it was. Yeah. I couldn't take that to work. He was my boss in essence. So there was some cold nights. That's what she's trying to tell you. <laughs> So a lot of cold nights. No, for sure. It was it was <laughs> terrible. It was a, a difficult time for me, but this is where this thing was but structure protects relationships. I had to come up with ways and means to protect that. So for example, I had to teach myself not to fight about work fight at the office and, and you know to bring the office fight home. I had to switch roles. I didn't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. You know? And then for example, one of the ways that I would deal with it was in order to switch off, Alvin would ask me at 10 o'clock in the night. And sorry for saying this, but this is what he used to do. Did you send that email? Did you reply to someone? Mm-hmm. So at 10 o'clock in the night, I had to learn to switch off. <laughs> and I had to learn to say, listen, I will answer you at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so what I had to do was I had to learn to switch off. So that I didn't bring home because I could see the stress and the strain it was bringing on the relationship. Now, this was before business for me. This was when he started the business, right? So it was difficult for me to have emails on my phone because I'd be answering in the middle of the night. So I removed work emails. So I'm here to give you guys some practical tips um, for the aspiring business women and men and their partners, you know, that don't know how to handle this part. This is the practical thing that I did that helped me. I removed my emails off my phone. So it would only be on my laptop. And if and when I get to it, I get to it. By the time I get home, I close my laptop. I'm at home now. And that's how it is. If he asks me work-related questions in the night, ask him. I have to tell him, I will tell you at 8 o'clock the next morning. Literally, mm. because that's what used to save me. I also felt so overwhelmed by constantly be doing things. And then he wants me to focus on cooking and home things. And, you know, and it was overwhelming for me. So these little things that are little changes that I made really helped me. Um, to switch modes from going from work to home very easily. Um, even like, for example, we would travel together, obviously coming from the same house. And then I never used, before I used to get like, I used to feel left out if you used to be with all the guys at his work and they would go for lunch and I'm sitting in the office by mm-hmm. myself. And then I realized that we needed the space. So it was okay for him to do things like that. You know, I can't always be with him. I mean, I had to give him the freedom to do those types of things. So that's just an example of little areas that I had to work on these foxes in my life and help me uh, put these structures in place to protect our relationship. You know, um, one of the areas that I think I can be extremely honest that Alvin still struggles with, and I know it is because it's, a, it's an ongoing, um, you know, it's a work in progress. So something that, that we always do is that he battles to switch off from mm-hmm. work, and rightfully so, because remember yeah. he handles three different businesses during the day. So he can't come home and just switch off into husband mode. It's really mm. difficult if I've got to remind him, hey, you can't be texting the hardware store and placing cement yeah. orders and all these things now when your kids go to bed at half to seven, you get home at six, you've only got an hour and a half with them, please go tuck them in or read a story or whatever the case is. Mm. So he is still learning that part of it and you know, this is an area that we are still trying to master, but he's come a long way than he was before mm. and the night was That's true. <laughs> what's wrong with you I <laughs> Yeah. It's come a long, long way. And the thing is that, you know, there's a lot of improvement, as I mentioned. And, you know, to the extent where we now can, if we're going out for dinner, we, you know, we can leave our phones at home just to have that peace because we're always being pulled on. And sometimes it's okay for us just to leave the phones at home and go out to have dinner. Or if we do need to take it, if it's not an emergency, put it in your bag and leave it. You know, things like that help us. Um, so it really takes a lot of work to do that. And, um, you know, I can, like I say, if I can understand Alvin because if, if you're not used to doing it, you're always in this boss mode. It's, it's very difficult for you to switch over and to become husband and to become dad mm-hmm. when all you know is how to be a boss, mm-hmm. you know. And this is, it brings me on to my next. So my very first point, like I said to you, was that I had to create and develop structures to protect us, our relationship at the time. You know, and those little things were the things I did. The second thing is I learned the power of agreement, number one. And I learned that there is power in allowing 
my husband to lead and make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. And when I say this, I want to clarify that I don't mean that I fell over and I was a doormat or that I wasn't, um, you know, a part of any decision making or anything. It just means that I decided to trust this man with our future mm -hmm. and trust that he had the best intentions for our family and that all he wants to do is move us forward. Mm -hmm. I decided that, you know what, it's okay for him to make decisions. All I asked was that I be considered, that you hear my opinion because he's a risk taker, I'm not a risk taker. And I think that's how we balance each other out. I'm the one that's always watching, you know, what if Alvin, what you're going to do if this happens. I'm the compliance person, the compliance officer, yeah. if I can say that. And he's the one that just, he, if he has a plan in his mind and if he justifies it to himself, it's going to work, it's going to work, mm -hmm. he forgets about the compliance. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that will say, but what about this, that, and the other? So I'm that person. But there is such a strength, if I can say, in allowing him to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and he considers my opinion. But ultimately, I don't hold a gun to his head to say, you have to go my way. I learned that there's a freedom in allowing him to lead our family because mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is we are married for 15 years and i only can think of one little occasion where he made a decision and it didn't work and you know at that point he realized it himself so he fixed it immediately so it wasn't as though we had to go through the dumps now to come back from that uh, decision so i allow him to make decisions on his own because he has to understand that if he has the ability to make the decision and you know when he does make those decisions, if it doesn't work, he's responsible. Mm. He's the one that has to take our family and fix it, you mm. know? And I think it's more pressure for him. And that's why he does what he does. When he comes to me with an idea, he comes with all his ducks in a row. I mm. come from a compliance perspective and we balance the two. And then I let him make the decision. It's okay. Go for it. I don't mind as long as I know that you've got our best interests at heart. And that's the second thing that I want to share is that there's always agreement when it comes to it. doesn't mean that I wholeheartedly agree with these ideas. Because let me tell you, when he told me one day, if I could give you an example, we're selling our house, ask him yeah. what happened. I went sick instantly, I promise you. <laughs> he just decided he's selling the house and like, you know, that kind of thing. And I was like, where are we going to? What are we going to do? How are we going to afford this? And all Couple these questions. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, is that he had a plan and, you know, he considers my opinion and I let him lead. So it worked. It always worked. And for 15 years, I'm still alive. My kids are still alive. So he's got to be doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, just the fact that he's responsible for the outcomes of those decisions, I think, is what holds him accountable and what he holds in his heart. Because at the end of the day, he's going to have to fix whatever, you know, doesn't work out, if I can say that. And uh, the power in letting him lead was a struggle for me in the beginning because I'm somebody that likes to control things. I'm a structured person. So I like to control processes. I like to be involved. You know, and it's always, not necessarily always my way, but I'm a strong person in that, in voicing my opinion. Um, so allowing him to take that was very important for me to learn. And eventually I did learn it. Fortunately, I learned it earlier on in my life. And that really, really helped us, you know. And this was all now building up to when we became business owners. Because let me share a story. The one day I was working with him and he sent out an email telling us, you know, we've been talking about the property business. And he sent out an email on the 17th of February telling the whole staff that Burrell is leaving at month end. And I was not prepared that I'm starting a business because firstly, I don't have any sales experience. I'm not a salesperson. So all of which, you know, this is what I'm talking about when I say Alvin makes decisions and that, you know, but fortunately, you know, this is the area that I want to share. And I was sharing with Rayleigh is that he saw something in me that I didn't see. I thought and I was content sharing in looking after his business and being a manager to him, you know, that kind of thing. But he saw something much greater in me. And this is why I always share about the power of mentorship to young girls. You know, when you trust God for your partner, you either get, you put yourself with either a destiny destroyer or a destiny partner, basically. And if you end up with the wrong person, it's not going to progress you forward. That's a problem because you're going to, you know, you, you are sabotaging your own future. And so this is why I'm saying I trusted Alvin with the decisions that he made. So when he sent out an email to say, listen, she's starting the company, that's it. What happened? Five years later, I have a company. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm I'm the director of the company and it's work. We're alive, we survive, we're actually thriving, by the way. Yes. In COVID, I sat it on for two months yes. and every single month my bills were paid, my stock was paid, there was no debits or anything like that. In fact, I had worked 
for the whole year while I was sitting in court with all my sales and things like that happened. And yet I said I wasn't a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, God put him in my life to draw out of these strengths that I didn't even know that I had. Um, and, you know, when we started the business and then the kids came along because now, remember at the beginning there wasn't kids and now there are kids. So balancing all of this is really difficult. And I think if I can just cut everything short because I've got a whole lot of notes here. And so the one point I just want to say is the fact that know each other's strengths and work with that. For example, financially, he's the guru, he knows numbers, I don't. So I let him lead in, in that area. I don't have a problem getting him full range. When it comes to my girls, I'm the authority in that area. You know, I know their school. I know what, you know, which function we both need to be at, which function I need to be at, you know, where I can take off his load, I will. So when it comes to certain areas, you just got to know each other's strengths mm. and play towards that. For me, that's mm. what helps with me because remember, I'm running the business. I've got kids. I must be a wife. I've got four staff. I'm still mentor them and I'm studying at the same mm. time. So it's very hectic. It's, it's overwhelming at times. Mm. But he can see where he needs to um, help me and I can see where I need to help him. So I make sure that my kids and well, my business rather fits into my kids' life. Mm -hmm. I structure my business around my children, mm -hmm. not the other way around. So that if I need to see a client to be before, after whatever obligation mm -hmm. they have first. Right. I try not to, you know, do evening appointments if I know that it's going to run into my kids' bedtime routine or, you know, that kind of thing. If I absolutely cannot help it, you will step in. Mm -hmm. So it's just literally playing towards each other's strengths and just knowing that you have that person's support yeah. um, and really just communicating. I mean, no, it's not a bad thing if I'm not good in the area of finance. I yeah. let him take control of that. Can I say something in terms of yes, that? Of course. Yeah, you know, she's touching on such an important point as well, is that as much as we are, uh, you know, passionate about our businesses mm -hmm. and we're passionate about, you know, being financially secure, is that we understand that it's all for our kids. Yeah. It's all for our family. You know, that's a big part of it. Mm. So it's no use to us that we're making all this money and we're we creating all this wealth, but we're not there for our kids. Yeah. We don't get to spend time with them. We don't get to go to their school plays. We don't get to be involved in their school. So we make sure that when it comes to our businesses, our businesses will work around our kids. Yeah. So if we need to attend, uh, something at nine o'clock in in the morning at the school, or there's a there's a presentation or anything like that. Then we both there. You know, my diary gets full. It's, Alvin's going to be at his daughter's rec uh, recital. But El understands it's 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 going to be like that. You know, and that's how we work. Mm -hmm. We we make sure that it's that's that we structure it around our kids so we can be there for our kids as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, and um, like I say, you know. If, if I can cut anything short and just the, the two points that I mentioned is structuring, uh, protecting, structure that protects our relationship, um, understanding the power in the agreement of the two being one and understanding that there's power in letting him lead in areas where he's strong and him allowing me to lead in areas where I'm strong and just understanding that your weakness is not a weakness, it's just an area one you're improving on that and managing your time well so that every department with its business, with its family and with its own marriage that we each get the best version of ourselves in those particular areas. And that's all I can really say, you know, it's a, it's a, a journey. Um, it's something that we are not claiming to have arrived. This mm -hmm. is what's worked for us so far. And we are open to the Holy Spirit teaching us other strategies to go, because obviously God is increasing in our stature and capacity, and we're going to mm -hmm. deal with much more going forward. So we're going to need more strategies. So really that's what is helping us and um, to move forward. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, um, we, we are quite real, the stop and see, you know, we, uh, who we are is who we are, you know, our face value. And they, they, you know, when people meet us and they see us, this is who we are, you know, we, we try our best to, to show people who we really are. Yeah. And uh, we, we, in terms of our business, I mean, we, we have many, and coming back to that, you know, I was just smiling a little bit because I have grown, you know. We have grown, you know, we've, we've started this journey from, from young, young, um, how can I say, from young adults, and we moved to a place where we're far more mature now. But we went through many, many challenges, you know. You know, I laughed about it, I said there was a lot of cold nights, but that's the truth. You know, we did. We went through many challenges at home where we were tested and, you know, where business got in the way of our relationship and stuff like that. And we had to speak through that and we had to talk about that, you know. Um, in terms of, of how 
you know, and start protecting ourselves and start teaching ourselves that, okay, you know, we can't allow this to affect our home life, yeah. you know, when we work and stuff like that. So when it comes to the business side and it comes to the family side of it, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I tell you something, I wish more couples can go into it because we are at a stage in our lives where I've given a free reign in terms of, of Kingdom Life real estate. You know, uh, I have... I have my side of the business, which I focus on, which is TMP and uh, the insurance side of the KLF. But I've said to her, I said, okay, you run this and you manage this, you know, and you run with it. And I've given her the freedom to that. Just involve me in some decision, important decisions or in terms of the direction of where we're going to go with the company, you know. Um, but otherwise, I've given her, she's almost, you know, in her uh, own person in the business, you know. And uh, we, we tend not to have so much conflicts now when it comes to home and business now because of that, you know. So um, that's where, you know, we've grown from in there. And that's, I believe, where God has grown us from as well in terms of, of business and family and our relationship with that. Oh, Pastor Bonner, I'm never going to invite us again. It's cool. It's just, I'm so yes. sorry. <laughs> Are we, we are so sorry for, for how long this went. Seriously, there was so much more to talk about. Uh, and we just skipped a little bit of it, yeah. But hopefully... You know, at another time, another place, and to be able to share something. So, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alvin and Vidal, for that wonderful presentation. I'm sure that many, many of the participants on the call this evening have been enthused, have been uh, encouraged, have been provoked um, to pursue. Yeah. Now, with greater confidence, um, their path toward business as well. And so, I want to just, on behalf of Gate Ministries Durban Central, and also on behalf of everybody on the call, to offer you our profound thanks, our sincerest thanks for taking the time and for communicating uh, with such uh, clarity and transparency your heart towards us this evening. If you have enjoyed the presentation, for those of you on video, would you wave your hands? Or maybe if your video is off, maybe use one of the icons. Um, and just to indicate somehow your appreciation, your gratitude for to Alvin and Vidal for the presentation given to us this evening. Thank you for your realness. Thank you for your down-to-earthness. Uh, thank you for just being you. I appreciate that. And I think it's, it's very um, liberating when you can be yourself and just showcase who you are and to demonstrate to others the degree of God's work in your life and the success that he has granted you in the business space. So once again, thank you so much for um, your candidness. Thank you just for, for being authentic and for showcasing even the difficult challenges that you had to navigate both in the business space, in your marriage life, in the family uh, domain as well. Thank you so much just for I think your, the degree to which you opened up speaks volumes beyond what you have said to those who have listened. It's beyond the content of your presentation. Tonight was an impartation of see what the Lord has done. It was an impartation of this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. So, um, and this is my prophetic perspective of what we've heard this evening, is that what I've received, and I speak on behalf of everyone, I think, is not just so much good tips, powerful principles, as powerful and as good as they are, but as you spoke, there was a keen sense of an impartational dynamic a grace transfer that I believe for those who are prepared to have received it, would have received it. So your speaking went beyond the audibility of your voice. 
to impact the quality of spirit in those who have heard. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has said to us, the church, this evening. In speaking to Alvin um, and Vidal, they literally have refused an honorarium. But um, I know the principle, and I know that to honor somebody financially is one of the most quickest ways to participate in the grace that they carry. And so partnering financially or sowing into somebody's life or ministry is a very powerful medium to access the grace that they carry relative to that ministry. And so I want to hugely encourage all of you on the call this evening to consider sowing into Alvin and Verdell's life and their businesses. You can use the details on your screen. That's our church bank account with APSA, 406-452-6307. As a reference, please indicate your name plus the reference L Verd. Okay, so we can ensure that these honorariums are directed to them as efficiently as we possibly can. Alvin is in the throes of the completion of his book, um, which we will look out for. And in speaking to him about honoring him financially, um, he preferred the option of supporting his book when it is launched. And that we will still do, that we will still do. So I will chat to him personally after this. Um, but um, I feel the need to perhaps direct these funds of honor towards him getting that book out. And even if it means us directing those funds to a publisher of his choice, that will kickstart the process and get it off running as, as quickly as possible based upon the preparedness of the finishedness of the book. So Alvin and Vidal, um, please receive our gratitude. Please receive our honor. Um, please receive our, our, our thanksgiving for all that you are and represent. Alvin has also uh, made available to us his notes this evening. So uh, my son, uh, Liam, if you are there, please just put my email address on the chat and or my cell phone number. Anybody on the call this evening, if you'd like access to what you've heard this evening via the notes, you can please just drop a request via email and or via WhatsApp, um, and we will gladly send the notes to you. I will also encourage you to track Alvin and to track Vidal on social media. Um, you can just search for their names, Please choose the right one because there are many Bedells I've come to come to learn on Facebook, Bedell Petersons and Alvin Petersons. Uh, you've seen the, you know them now, so you will easily be able to recognize them. Track Kingdom Life and TMP as well. And um, I'm sure they will appreciate the support via social media as well. Uh, I forgot to mention this, that Fidel and, and Alvin are spiritual sons to Dr. Basil and, I, and Anne Trine from New Covenant Fellowship, uh, individuals for which we have the highest of regard here in the city of, of Durban. So they come under accountability, they come under oversight. And so we are profoundly grateful for that. Uh, Alvin is also a very good bassist, uh, musician, uh, I'm a musician as well, so I appreciate that. And Vidal is also a phenomenal singer. Well, if you know her brothers as well, they're, they're all very, very good in the music department, in the vocal section, and in the musicianship section. So uh, um, they are very, very well-rounded individuals in business, as persons in their own right, as married couples, as husband, as wife as involved in kingdom affairs, in church affairs. And I like what Vidal said towards the end of the presentation, that it's nothing but the grace of God that is required to have a sense of balance and effectiveness in reference to all of these things. 
And I want to encourage us all as we conclude this evening to really highly apprise the grace of Christ in all that we do. I am what I am by the grace of God, Paul said, and I work yet not I, but grace that is with me. And I want to encourage us to grow in this dynamic of the grace of God. I want you to do me a favor. This video is obviously live streamed on the Gate Ministries Durban Central Facebook page. Do me a favor and share it so that others could benefit from this presentation. Uh, in the course of tomorrow or by late this evening, it will be on the Gate Ministries Durban Central's YouTube channel as well. And I will encourage you to share that when it does become available. A video presentation will also be on my second Facebook page, Randolph Barnwell Ministry page, and that will be done in the course of tomorrow morning as well. Our intention is not fame. Our intention is not publicity for its own sake. Our heart is to share good news, wise principles with as many people as possible. And I think you've heard Alvin's heart in his good to educate others and to lead others in the same success that he has enjoyed. And so I want you to do us a favor by, and this is your methodology also of sowing, to, to reach out to others. And he who refreshes others will of himself also be refreshed and replenished in the Lord. Before we conclude, I'm going to ask uh, Alvin to unmute and to offer up a prayer of impartation and blessing for everybody that has been on the call this evening. And as he prays, this is not just a nice way of concluding the session. This prayer is impartational. So I want to encourage you, lift your hands in the venue where you are, bow your hearts, and expect to receive an impartation transfer of this grace you will be more successful yes by doing things and things you do must be done and there's also this dynamic of looking at one who has gone before especially as the son of god and under the grace of christ is willing to impart that by prayer and proclamation so thank you alvin for praying for us vidal please feel free to pray as well if you are so lit and Thank you. So, Father, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for this live Zoom uh, business session that we've had this evening with uh, Gate Ministries, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we could share your word, and not only your word that would empower us, Lord God, but we'd share more some tips and some ideas and some mindsets, Lord, that we'd love to change your I thank, thank you, Lord God, that what you've been in my life as a young boy that was lost, that was suicidal, a boy that had grown up in an unstable home, Lord, that had failed in his life and felt it failed like a felt like a failure. And what you've done with that young boy and where you brought him to today and Buddha, Lord. I pray, Lord, that every person that was listening to our voice today, every person, every individual, every mom and dad, every person that had been through similar stuff or, or had had, could identify with everything, Lord, that we had went through. I pray that you would show them that there is a better life. I pray that, Lord, that you show them that they are not for failure, Lord God, that, Lord, that you have made them, Lord, that you have called them, Lord God, that you have set them apart. And I pray, Lord, that you will elevate them and lift them up. I pray that these words that were spoken today, Lord, that they will embed not only in their minds, but in their hearts, Lord. And I pray that it will give birth, Lord, to greater things, Lord, that we should see manifestation of greater stuff happening in their lives, Lord. We pray that businesses will be birthed today. New ideas and new businesses will be birthed today. 
successful businesses, Lord, that where once they thought that they couldn't do, Lord, they can do today, we pray, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that this will be inspired by your presence, inspired by your word, inspired by your Holy Spirit today, Lord God, that you would take charge of this, Lord God. You would take charge as we conclude today, Lord God, and you will give them the desires of their heart, Lord. Show them that they are their heads today and they are not the tails, Lord. Show them that they are above and not beneath today, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would come through for them in the name of Jesus. So we conclude this meeting and we thank you, Lord. Thank you for the host, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you will continue to, to move with them, Lord. Continue to, to, to support them, Lord, in every avenue, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue to lift them up, Lord, that they could share the grace of God to many as we move forward, Lord. So we pray for this in the name of Jesus. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. 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 Well, thank you so much again, Alvin and Vidal. And thank you to everybody else that has come on the Zoom meeting this evening. Have a great evening and have a great business experience. Position your mind to buy your first property in the name of Jesus. Amen. For those of you that haven't entered the property market, go for your second one if you have your first. And pursue your third if you have your second. In Jesus' name, amen. Build up a property portfolio. That has been a buzzword for me this evening. And so thank you so much. We had received a prophecy just for your information years ago where the uh, true independent prophet said that the PIN code over the ministry will be property, the PIN code. Okay, so uh, thank you so much just for cajoling us and for pushing us and reminding us of these things. Amen. Have a great evening, great grace, and abundant peace be with you all. God bless you. Have a great night. Amen. Get ready.